So far, in our discussion of how the visual system processes light, we focused on the role of the cones, and the cones have a really important role. To recap, the first step in coding for color happens via the simultaneous activity of the three types of cones, the short, medium, and long wavelength sensitive cones. We know that something is blue and not yellow in part because short wavelength light causes a large change in the activity level of short cones, but not much in the activity level of medium and long cones. However, there are some things that trichromatic theory can't explain. There are issues related to visual processing that we've dealt with so far um, that we don't yet have the tools to understand. So today, we're going to deal with that. One is the example that, that Jason gave in class, where he pointed out that if you had a friend say, I've got a new car, it's yellow. Well, it's got just a little touch of red in it. You'd know what they mean. They mean they have a slightly orangish car. But if they said, I got a new car, it's yellow with just a little bit of blue in it, that would break our tender brains because there isn't a color that we can imagine that has components of both yellow and blue that, that retains elements of both of those colors. And in fact, if you look at what the combination of those make, the first is a perfectly logical orange, it's kind of between yellow and red, um, but the second is an achromatic gray. There's nothing yellowish or bluish in that. So calling it yellowish blue isn't descriptive of, of what it makes at all. And there isn't really anything in trichromatic theory that explains why the middle point between blue and yellow should look gray. This inability of some colors to be combined led Ewald Herring in the 1890s to propose an alternate system of color coding. He referred to colors that cannot be perceived at the same time, like red and green or yellow and blue. He called them opponent colors. They are opponents because they are mutually exclusive. They're shown here across from one another. So for example, in, in subtractive color mixing, if we have some red paint and some yellow paint, orange is a mixture of those two. Uh, but there are no places where red and green mix, as shown by the lack of overlap here. So Herring thought that the colors red, yellow, green, and blue are special in that any other color can be described as a mix of them, and that they exist in, in opposite and opposing pairs. That is, either red or green is perceived, and never greenish red. Even though yellow is a mixture of red and green in RGB color theory, the eye does not perceive it as a mixture of green and red, right? If you mix green and red together to make yellow, we wouldn't call that yellow a reddish green. So opponent process theory was born. But the question is, how can it be that we have three cone types, but four unique colors? The answer lies in the structure of the eye. We, we talked in trichromatic theory uh, about how each retinal ganglion cell gets input from multiple different types of cones. And there are in fact uh, two different classes of retinal ganglion cells that are responsible for coding for four colors, a red and green circuit and a yellow and blue circuit. So the red and green circuit here uh, is, is showing a retinal ganglion cell that's getting input from both long and medium cones, and so is coding for red and green. The one on the right is getting input from all three cone types and is coding for yellow and blue. Let's walk through an example of this. We're going to focus first on our red and green circuit. So the cones are at the top, retinal ganglion cell at the bottom. Um, note there are also bipolar cells and other types of cells in here. This is just a, a simplified version. So this retinal ganglion cell is going to collect information from the medium and long cones. And the signal that it sends up to the brain is going to carry information about whether there is medium or long wavelength light present. And the way that it can achieve this is by increasing or decreasing its firing rate. Recall that I mentioned that a cell's rate of action potentials can go up, that's what's referred to as an excitatory signal, or go down, meaning it's an, an inhibitory signal. So this particular retinal ganglion cell is what we call an L plus M minus, or a red plus green minus cell, meaning it is excited by long wavelength light. Long wavelength light makes the rate of action potentials increase, and it is inhibited by medium wavelength light. So medium wavelength light makes the rate of action potentials decrease. So if we were to stick an electrode in that retinal ganglion cell and measure the rate at which it produces action potentials, when we shine long wavelength light on a cone that's connected to that retinal ganglion cell, it fires really regularly, it fires really quickly. When we shine medium wavelength light on a cone connected to that retinal ganglion cell, it fires really infrequently. So this is a case of a retinal ganglion cell that is excited by long wavelength light. 
There are also a, a, a reverse kind of retinal ganglion cell that also code for red and green, but use the opposite coding scheme. So here, the, the, the schematic that's shown is again, a simplified version of two cones connected to a retinal ganglion cell. But this cell is now an M plus L minus retinal ganglion cell, meaning that medium wavelength light causes the firing rate of the retinal ganglion cell to increase and long wavelength light causes it to decrease. So what's neat about this is that just by measuring the rate of action potentials in that retinal ganglion cell, we can tell is there medium wavelength light present or long wavelength light present. Okay, in addition to the red and green circuit, we also have yellow blue circuits. So this blue yellow circuit is excited by changes in activity in short cones, meaning it will fire more action potentials in the presence of blue light. So it's an S plus ML minus or a blue plus yellow minus retinal ganglion cell. Note that the blue yellow circuit differs from the red green circuit in that it is getting input from all three cone types because yellow is coded for as the simultaneous activity in medium and long cones. So in order to detect the presence of yellow, we have to have a retinal ganglion cell that's getting input from both of the cone types that code for yellow. So let's walk through an example of how this S plus ML minus retinal ganglion cell responds to different types of input. If we present short wavelength light, what we would perceive as blue to the eye, we know from trichromatic theory that that is gonna to lead to a large change in the response of the short cones and not much change in activity in the medium and long cones. Increased activity in the short cones leads our S plus ML minus retinal ganglion cell to, to fire away. Uh, this is a schematic of the rates of action potentials. Prior to stimulation, the firing rate is low. Um, you present blue light to the cell where that little blue bar appears and the firing rate increases. The cell is excited. It's being like, this is my favorite wavelength. This is my favorite color of light. Pew, 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 pew. That's it firing. Okay, we can contrast this with what happens in the presence of, of yellow light. So in the presence of yellow light, we see high levels of activity in the medium and long wavelength sensitive cones. Uh, and that change in activity in the medium and long cones leads to a decreased rate of action potentials from the retinal ganglion cells. So again, before the presentation of the yellow light, you see this uh, uh, kind of moderate baseline level of, of activity. You present the yellow light and it's now inhibited. It is firing below its regular resting firing rate. So we have a mechanism for coding for, is it red or green and is it yellow or blue? There's a third type of circuit um, that uh, what's, what's sometimes called a black and white circuit or a brightness circuit that gets input from both the medium and long wavelength sensitive cones that codes for the overall level of illumination or brightness uh, independent of the, the, the color or the wavelengths of light that are present. So. Now that we have a good handle on trichromatic theory and opponent process theory, we can understand some really cool phenomena in visual processing. To demonstrate the first one, I want you to stare at the image on your screen. Look right at that little white cross by the cherry. Keep your eyes fixed on that point. Don't look around. Try to keep your head steady. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. The longer and more carefully you do this, the better it will be. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. This is a black and white image. What? Okay. What? Okay. Let's do a Carlton specific one to see if this works with any Minnesota landmarks or only cherries and spoons. Stare, stare, stare. Stare, stare, stare. Stare, stare, stare. black and white image. <gasps> All right, so what you just experienced is called a color after image. Recall that when you look at an object, it's causing the photopigment in your cones to isomerize or bleach, sometimes referred to as, as adapting. And regenerating that photopigment takes some time. So if a given cone keeps getting the same input, keeps getting activated by the same light, uh, the photopigment becomes depleted. It's used up more quickly than it can be regenerated. 
This doesn't typically happen in normal life because we're looking around in different places and seeing lots of different color, lots of different wavelengths of light. So the stimulation of a single cone isn't consistent over time. So let's through an ex work through an example of exactly what's happening when you stare at an image for a long time and then look at an achromatic, uh, a, a white or a gray um, field. So typically, this is the pattern of activity you see in cones uh, in response to blue and yellow and, and white light. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that all of the cones are changing their activity in the presence of white light because it contains all wavelengths of light. So if you stare continuously at something blue, for instance, over time, the short cone pigment gets depleted. So the, the response of the short wavelength sensitive cones is going to be reduced after adaptation relative to what it would be when you first look at something blue. Then if you switch to looking at something white, now that, that should lead to high levels of activation in the short, medium, and long cones. But because the short cones are somewhat depleted, it leads to somewhat less activity in the short cones than you would typically expect. So what does low levels of activity in the short cones and higher levels of activity in the medium and long cones look like to us? it looks like yellow. So looking at something white after you have adapted to something blue leads to the perception of yellow because of the depletion of the, the photopigment in those short wavelength sensitive cones. Here's another way of thinking about this. If you stare at something blue, the pigment in your short cones is depleted. So activity in short cones is, is reduced. Given that blue and yellow are an opponent pair, when you switch to looking at something white, the short cones are not counteracting the medium and long cones as they typically would, so the resulting image is yellower than it typically would be. Further, staring at something blue doesn't deplete photopigment in your medium and long cones, so when you switch to the white light, they are still active, also leading to the perception of yellow. Cool, right? All right, one, one nice way of playing with color after images, experimenting with color after image, is, is, is what's called the lilac chaser illusion. So I want you to, again, keep your eyes fixed at the X in the center of the screen. You see one dot in a ring of dots that is blinking off at a time. This leads to the impression of a single dot that is running around the circle. That's a, that's a motion illusion that's interesting, but not for color reasons. As you continue to stare, you'll also notice that the missing dot, rather than looking like a blank gray space in the background, starts to look yellow as the pigment in the short cones is depleted. As you stare longer, you may also start to notice that the blue dots that are present uh, start to fade into the background as well. So that's the photopigment in the, in the short wavelength sensitive cones becoming very depleted. If you move your eyes around, if you look somewhere else on the screen or even off the screen, um, the, the yellow dot will disappear and the blue dots will reappear. That happens because the blue circles are now falling on, on different cones that have fresh photopigment. So heading into class, here's what you should have a good handle on. Trichromatic theory describes the process by which three types of cones code for all of the wavelengths along the visible spectrum, and some off of it as well, as well of course. Opponent process theory describes how retinal ganglion cells interpret the output from the cones via a red-green circuit and a yellow-blue circuit, as well as that circuit for brightness. So trichromatic theory and opponent process theory are not competing theories. They are different parts. They're describing different parts of the same process. In class, we're going to talk more about why the visual system might be arranged in this particular configuration and practice working with opponent colors. See you in class.